Merry Christmas, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us today. I, I hope that you had a great Christmas yesterday. I know in our house we're having a great Christmas season, but tomorrow, December 27th, is a big day for our family because it is the day of the annual Christmas Bake Off. That's right. My oldest daughter, Anna Claire, will have a baking competition with her uncle Matt tomorrow. And it is a no holds barred winner take all. I mean, it is a it is a big deal in our house. Anna Claire, she loves baking. She's fantastic at baking. She has drawers in our kitchen dedicated to baking supplies that only she uses. Big deal. Now, on the other hand, I have my oldest son who at Thanksgiving said to me, hey, dad, I'd like to learn how to cook. So this is a kid who, you know, been around a little bit, probably knew how to make a pancake, but hadn't really done much in the kitchen. And he said he wanted to learn to cook. And I do most of the cooking in our house. So we had a good time over Thanksgiving. Uh, we made a shepherd's pie. We made a hash brown casserole. It, it, was, it was a good time. And so I have my, my daughter who loves baking and I have my son who loves cooking. And I said to, to Josiah, as we're doing cooking, I said, buddy, you gotta realize there's a big difference between cooking and baking. With baking, you have to be precise. You have to measure exactly everything is, is really specific, but with cooking, it's a lot, it's a lot looser. There's a, there's a recipe, but you know, you want to add a little extra onion, a little more garlic, you go for it. There's a lot more, there's a lot more flexibility with the recipes and the cooking. Well, today I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about prayer, about prayer. And I would love to offer you Jesus recipe for prayer. And the reason I'd like for you to think about it like a cooking recipe rather than baking is that these are not rules for prayer. This is Jesus' suggestion. It's a, it's a pattern. It's a way of approaching him in prayer. It's often called the Lord's Prayer. And it's something that if you've been around church for very long, you've probably heard, you're probably familiar with, you may have even heard me teach on it before, but it is amazing how quickly we forget Jesus' instructions. And here, here's my hypothesis about most of us. I assume that, that most of us, we tend to think that, well, we could just do better in prayer. And if that's you today, if you feel like you could do better in prayer, I am so glad that you're listening. And I hope that this will encourage you to have a new pattern to follow, not as a rule, but as a recipe, as some guidelines. And so this is found in Matthew chapter six, beginning at verse nine. I'm gonna actually list the Lord's prayer in terms of numbers one through six, rather than giving you the verse references. But if you go to the gospel of Matthew chapter six, look around verse nine, you will discover that Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, this is how you should pray. And he began like this. He said, begin like this, our father in heaven. This is how the verse starts. Our father in heaven. And the first thing we have to remember when we are praying is that we have a relationship with our father who is in heaven. He is our heavenly father. Now, when you think about God as heavenly father, I want us to remember that when he says that, that God is in heaven, it's not that he is up there somewhere that we can't get to, but it's that he is different from us and yet also, and this is surprising, near to us. See, in, in Judaism in the first century, the, the, um, the Jewish people assumed that if you wanted to be in God's presence, if you really wanted your prayers to be heard, you had to go to the temple. You had to go to the temple where God's presence was. But Jesus is introducing his followers to a whole new way of thinking about God, not as someone who is isolated from them and you have to go to the temple, but rather someone who is drawn near to them. We're going to see in just a minute that, that Jesus' whole ministry was to bring heaven and earth together. Not that heaven is far away from earth, but that God is intending to bring the purposes of heaven to earth. And so as our heavenly father, he has come near to us. He's letting them know, you don't have to go to the temple. That's not the first thing he said. When you pray, get, in, you know, get your walking shoes on, get your stick and a backpack and go to the temple. No, no, no. When you pray, simply stop, pause, and acknowledge. You're talking to someone. You're talking to your heavenly father, father, someone who cares, someone who provides, someone who loves you. Now, I also want to just acknowledge, and we have to, I think we have to do this every time, that when we think about God as our heavenly father, um, not everyone has a positive experience with their earthly father. So, some of you have very negative experiences with your earthly father. And if that's the case, I'll always remember this truth. 
God is not the reflection of your earthly father. He is the perfection of your earthly father. And when you think about the ways you have been hurt, wounded, disappointed by your earthly father, just remember that your heavenly father would, would never do that to you. He, he is the opposite. He is not the reflection. He's the perfection. And, and that longing you have for closeness and care, God put that in you. And he wants to be that heavenly father for you. So when we go to pray, he's not angry. He's not mad. He's not unable. He is a father ready to listen to you. We got to get our posture right. Who am I talking to? I'm talking to my heavenly father. And then the next thing he says in the prayer when Jesus is teaching us to pray, second proposition is hallowed be your name. Heavenly father, hallowed be your name. Now this word hallowed, that's not something we say very much. What does hallowed mean? It means to, to make holy, to set apart, to sanctify. And what Jesus is getting at here, what he's getting at is that the first thing after we recognize that he's our heavenly father should be to get our mind settled on his greatness, on who he is, on what he's done. It's, it's so easy for us to come to God with a list. It's so easy to come to God with our concerns. And Jesus is teaching us, no, no, you, you want to pray well? Here's what you do. You think about who you're talking about, and then you pray that his name would be made great. Um, there, there's a fantastic verse in, in Isaiah. Isaiah 26, 8 says, the, the prophet Isaiah says, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth, we wait eagerly for you, for your name and your renown are the desire of our souls. That, that's the, 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 the heart of this second petition in the Lord's prayer, that we pause and we think about how great God is and how great his name is and whatever you know about him, whatever you have seen him, maybe you've read it in a, in a different part of the scriptures, maybe you've read it in the Psalms, maybe you've done a study in the past, you, you stop to think, okay, God, no, may your name be set apart. This is about who you are and what you're doing as my heavenly father. May your name, God, I want your name to be made great. I, I know for me personally, um, when, I, when I pray this, just how I'm wired and how I'm tempted, I, I have to pray regularly, God, I want your name to be hallowed, not mine. I don't want you to make my name famous. I don't want you to make our church famous. God, I want your name to be lifted up. When people encounter us here at Grace Bible Church, our prayer is they will say, God is great. Hallowed be his name. May his name be made holy, exalted, lifted up. We gotta pray that because there's something in us that tends to wanna make it about ourselves. Hallowed be your name. And then we might think that, okay, now we get to our list of stuff, but that's not true. Look at the, the next thing he comes to. He says, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I'm, I, when I'm praying through the Lord's Prayer, I, I, I'll be honest, I pray through this pretty regularly. This is sort of my default pattern. This is where I spend most of my personal time praying. And oftentimes I just get stuck right here. I, I oftentimes don't make it to the bottom end of the prayer, which is not a positive thing. It's just a thing uh, because I can get lost in this idea of his kingdom coming. What does it mean for his kingdom to come? Isn't it incredible to think about the fact that Jesus is a king, that he is ruling and reigning, that he has purposes on this earth and it's so easy for me, distract, for me to get distracted with what I want, what I think should happen, that when I really stop and say, okay, God, may your kingdom come. Okay, your kingdom, your rule, your reign. I am created in God's image. I am not God. God, may your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we begin to really think about the kingdom of God coming, it changes the way we think about the world. And here, here, here's the way this can help us today. God's kingdom is not my kingdom. God's agenda is not my agenda. And it's easy for us to fall into this trap of thinking that prayer is, prayer is about getting stuff from God, right? Why do I pray? Because things aren't the way I want them to be. And I think that if I pray, maybe I'll get what I want. Sometimes that's a little thing. Sometimes it's a big thing. But it's easy for us to mistakenly think that the purpose of prayer is to get stuff from God. And then we run into this third petition, your kingdom come, your will be done. And it reminds us, it reminds us about the purpose of prayer. Here, here's the heart of the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not to impose our will. The primary purpose of prayer is to surrender our will to the heavenly father who loves us. 
And we have to pray until we are willing to surrender our wills to his will. How long should you pray? You should pray until you can say, God, not my will, but your will be done. Pray until you can say, God, may your kingdom come and your will be done, even if it's not what I would want. And and this helps us so much because we think like, well, isn't God going to do it anyway? Why do I need to pray? Isn't, you know, God sovereign? Okay, no, no, you're missing the point of prayer. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God is at work in the universe. But he wants a relationship with you that as heavenly father, you orient your, because he's your heavenly father, he wants you to orient your life to make his name great and to surrender your will. The purpose of prayer is not to get what you want. It's to surrender to what he wants for you. And then that will lead us to the end of that third petition, which is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's desire is for his people to make a difference on earth and that earth would be conformed to his will, his desire. Right at the, at the end of the story, we're not disembodied beings floating around on clouds. At the, at the end of the story, when Jesus returns, we're gonna be on the new earth. And on the new earth with our resurrection bodies, we will enjoy life as it was intended to be at the beginning at creation. But between creation and new creation, we live in this in-between time. And so we pray, God, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done. So, okay, how do do we think about that? How, How do we know what God's will is on earth? There's a really simple question you can ask. There's a really simple question you can ask to try to wrap your mind around on earth as it is in heaven. And here, here's the question. Ask yourself, is this how God intended things to be? Is this how God intended things to be? So you could take an issue, you could take an ideology, you can take an idea. Is this how God intended things to be? And, and, and as you're thinking about it, you have to think about not just yourself, but how it affects others, how our decisions affect others, because God wants to bless all people. He wants his people to be blessed, to be a blessing. So why do we care about sex trafficking? Because it's not how God intended things to be. Isn't that a social gospel? No, the gospel is always social because God cares about people. And so we pray for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. It's why we work for racial unity. Did God intend for people to show favoritism one over another because of the color of their skin? Of course not. All people are created in God's image. It's not how God intended things to be. It's why we want to lift up women because God intended the genders to love and serve one another with equality. It's why we care about homelessness. It's why we're for families and schools. Because we just say, God, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you're thinking about something, simple way to to get to this. Is this how God intended things to be? Now, after these three, first three ideas, we get to the fourth petition in the Lord's Prayer. And now we're asking for something. We say, give us today our daily bread. Now, in the first century, when there were no preservatives like we have today, in the first century, when starvation was a much more likely effect based on what was happening with crops, this was a a much more meaningful prayer, literally daily bread. But it it wasn't just that it was daily bread in that, God, I need you to provide for me today, but for the people of Israel. And don't forget, Jesus was Jewish. All of his disciples were Jewish Jewish. For these Jewish men, for these Jewish women listening to Jesus teach, give us today our daily bread was a reminder of the Exodus account. You know the story of the Exodus where the Israelites were in slavery for 400 years and God sent Moses to deliver his people from Pharaoh. They crossed over the Red Sea. And then they go and as they're wandering towards the promised land for all those years, God feeds them day by day by day. He says, here's how it's gonna work. Every day you go out, you gather what you need for that day. Don't leave any left over. And every day I'll give you new daily bread. And every day I'll give you new daily bread. And every day I'll give you new daily bread. And the point was trusting God for provision. The point was the relationship, trusting God for our provision. And so we have to do that. And so we pray, God, give us today our daily bread. Help me to trust you for what you've given me today. And what does that do? It keeps us in relationship, keeps us connected to our heavenly father. We've already been praying for his name to be great, his kingdom to come. Now, as we think about his provision in our lives, we're going to think about it through the lens of his kingdom and his name 
and how much he loves us as heavenly father. But it's about trust. It's about that relationship that we have with him. As we're praying, we're moving for the relationship. So give us today our daily bread. And then what's the next thing he asks us to pray for? Well, we didn't see this one coming. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Depending on how old you are, what translations you've read, you may have read, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our trespassers. You may have heard, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The the point is, forgive us what we owe as we have forgiven those who owe us. Now, I want you to look at the order here because it's not accidental. What does Jesus say our primary focus should be? Where does Jesus want our primary focus to be? He says, first of all, please forgive me, God. Forgive us our debts. Please forgive me. I'm just trying to make this clear. Please forgive me and forgive forgive me as I have forgiven others. Whoa. What? Is that really what that means? Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. God, please forgive me. And God, go ahead and forgive me as I have forgiven others. Now, let's, let's be honest, guys. I mean, if, you, if you've got somebody who's hurt you, you've got pain in your life, you've got someone you need to forgive, that's, this, is a, this is a tough teaching. This is a tough teaching. But Jesus is helping us here. He's helping you. He's helping me. The more we will make our prayer life about focusing first on how much we need to be forgiven, God will do something inside of us that will free us to forgive others. And anyone who's wrestled with forgiveness has found this to be true. That's why Jesus in a parable later in his ministry said the one who has been forgiven much loves much. He calls us to first, God, would you forgive me for what I've done? And when you go to pray, when you spend time praying, it's easy to think about how we've been hurt. But he calls us to first say, forgive me. And then, well, then help me to be forgiven as I have forgiven others. See, the more I recognize my need for forgiveness, the more willing I am to forgive you. Uh, last, Last part of the prayer. Last part of the prayer, he says this. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You might think, well, that seems odd. Why, why would we have to pray not lead us into temptation? Well, that one, one thing we could do here is recognize that it, we could read it like, and lead us. As in God, God, lead us. Show us the direction. Help us to go. And as you lead us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Now, it could have been that when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he was giving them foreshadowing for what he was going to teach them several, several years later. See, you may or may not remember the story, but when Jesus was on his way to the cross, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He took his disciples with him. He he took his three closest disciples even farther with him. He said, you wait here. I'm going to go and pray. And Jesus goes and he prays and he he falls down and he weeps before God. He says, God, not my will, but your will be done. He lives out the prayer he taught them to pray. And then he comes back and he sees his disciples asleep and he, and he says to them, watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation. That's what he told his disciples. The same thing he taught them to pray all those years later at the end. What's he doing? He's saying, watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. And what's he doing? He's going, he's saying, father, not my will, but your will be done. This pattern that he taught them, he, he was just demonstrating it to the end. So so as you think about 2022, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to use the Lord's Prayer as a pattern in your own life. And and specifically, I just want to encourage you to do two things. Number one, make time to be alone. Make time to be alone. There's something that happens when we slow down on our own, quiet space, and we give God some time to reflect. And we work through these petitions. I'm telling you, you will, you'll be shocked. You will be able to pray for 15, 20, 30 minutes easily. If you can get some space, you carve out the 30 minutes, you get alone, you have your Bible, paper Bible. Maybe you have these written down somewhere and you just work through the petitions. And you spend some time thinking about what it means that he's your heavenly father. Think about some time, your will, your kingdom, your name, Forgive me, lead me. And you just soak in it. Don't rush. 
Don't rush. Play, pray slowly through the Lord's prayer. Because what, what does your heavenly father want for you? He wants a relationship. He doesn't want you to feel judged or guilted into spending time with him. He invites you because he loves you to come and to allow him to speak to you and encourage you and bless you. So in 2022, don't worry about baking. Don't worry about getting it perfect. Don't worry about having to do it exactly right. But follow the recipe. Follow the recipe and see how God might meet you in your prayer life this year. Let, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we do pray that your name will be hallowed, that your name will be lifted up. We pray that your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.